So seeing how Spider-Man Homecoming is a few weeks behind us and I've seen it a few times, I feel now I can comfortably rank it among all the Spider-Man films as to which one is my favorite. Keep in mind this is not a list of which ones I think is best or which one I prefer. This list is based on which one I think is the best representation of the character while also being the best most coherent movie. So with that in mind, let's get into number 6, which is The Amazing Spider-Man 2. I don't think it's much of a secret that I'm not the biggest fan of this movie. Now does the film have a bunch of things I like? Of course it does. But when I take the film as a whole, it just has a lot of problems. From the characters having moments that just do not reflect the comics, to the flippy floppy way Peter Parker handles his relationship with Gwen, to the way too many stuffed villains and things to trying to hint at the future of this cinematic universe, the film just leaves a lot to be desired. Now at the same time, let's give the movie credits where it's due. The suit in the movie is probably the best Spider-Man live action suit so far. It's straight up ripped off from the comics. Emma Stone as Gwen Stacy is really perfect. But when you watch the movie, keep track of how much Spider-Man is actually in it. Very little. Hell, there's moments where Peter Parker is literally portrayed like he's a moron who doesn't know basic science. And when it comes to the actual climax of the movie, it's very anticlimactic and actually emotionless considering you can see what's happening from a mile away. It really won't surprise me if most people would agree that this is probably their least favorite, or at least in the top two least favorite Spider-Man movies. But man, are these comments gonna tell me I'm wrong. Next up, we have the untold story of Spider-Man. What exactly is untold? I have no idea, and neither did they. Peter Parker might be engineered by his dad to become Spider-Man, maybe not. I don't know, they seem to have cut that out along with half the other movie. Peter Parker is portrayed as unlikable and unpopular, although he's the best looking kid in school arguably, but then again he doesn't seem to even invent his own webbing so they kind of play him off as someone who doesn't really understand what science is, which isn't really Peter Parker if you ask me. But then again, the movie did try something else. They went with the more Spider-Man might be a menace and the town does not accept them, which honestly, that's a pretty cool direction to take the character in and Spider-Man has done that in the comics. We finally got to see the lizard as a villain, so that's really cool considering there's only actually one villain in the film. And we actually got a good Gwen Stacy and not Mary Jane like the Tobey Maguire films. Truth be told, I actually enjoy The Amazing Spider-Man as a film. I think it's a bold new take that they should have stuck with, honestly, and they shouldn't have went more Raimi with The Amazing Spider-Man 2. Because I think if they would have kept going with the untold story, this could have been a franchise that tells us something different than we didn't have before. Unfortunately, that wasn't to be. Oh, Spider-Man 3, the question of what if we got a complete movie that the studio didn't interfere with. Well, that's exactly what Spider-Man 3 will forever be. Now, don't get me wrong, there's a lot I like about this movie. I'm okay with the casting of Eddie Brock. Sandman was probably one of the better characters in the movie. Unfortunately, everything comes crashing and burning when the studio forced Sam Raimi to shove Venom in there. And then also include a dance number that... Well, the less we say about it, the better. I understand what they were going for, it just didn't come across that way. But this does still remain Sony's biggest movie of all time, and also the biggest Spider-Man movie of all time. But it's those unfortunate mistakes and directions that they take the movie in that really just kind of don't work. Too many things going on at one time. And once again, they seem to want to repeat the same thing from the first two movies with Mary Jane and Peter Parker. And let's be real, when he puts on the black suit, it doesn't look the way we want it to, and it definitely doesn't scream that comic book interpretation brought to the big screen. Now we could overlook all of this if maybe the script was solid. Unfortunately, the script is all over the place and they have to play favorites to the studio, so it ends up just kind of falling apart and looking lazy. And then there's Venom himself. The less I say about him, the better. Next up, the first solo outing for Sam Raimi and his Spider-Man. Of course, Spider-Man 1. What more is to say about this movie that hasn't been said? This is literally one of the two movies that helped save the superhero genre after the huge bomb that killed it, which was Batman and Robin. Unlike X-Men, which were afraid to embrace the comic book side of it by featuring colors and crazy comic book accuracy, they said, ah, whatever, just do it. Bright suit, bright New York, crazy special effects. In a post-9-11 age where New York needed a, a hero that could come in a perfect 
perfect time and unite everybody. This was it. Sure, some of the choices on what the villain looked like might not have been great. And sure, Tobey Maguire's Peter Parker and Spider-Man are probably the worst ones when it comes to defining and comparing him to the comic book character. You can't deny that these movies have definitely become classics in Hollywood. Spawning many iconic scenes and even being the reason that the Marvel Cinematic Universe exists today. And of course, if you can pull off one villain, it probably means that you have a very solid script. And they definitely do. After that, we see the follow-up to Sam Raimi with Spider-Man 2 and my personal favorite Spider-Man movie. Yes, it's not the best Spider-Man movie, it's not the most representative of the comics, but this one holds a special place in my heart. And what's there to say about it that isn't true? And what can I say about this movie that hasn't been said before? When you think about movies that many critics will hail as one of the top comic book movies, and not just that, one of the top movies of the last decade, Spider-Man 2 will show up in those lists. They took everything that worked about the first and fixed it and improved upon it. They took the things that didn't work and improved upon those. Every single actor has time to shine, and we really see a great Spider-Man story with one villain that is very closely tied to the hero. We see Spider-Man in an emotional state and we get those stories that we love from the comics where he is having a really hard time balancing out everything he has to do. Spider-Man's biggest enemy is himself and this movie represents that very well. And of course with that they go and develop his best friend's relationship, his girlfriend, pretty much everything is touched upon here and the evolution of the character from the first movie to the second is bar none one of the best in a comic book movie. But there's only one Spider-Man movie that can possibly be better than that one when it comes to comic book accuracy and that's Spider-Man Homecoming. Unlike the previous two series they don't try to take Peter Parker out of school too much. They very much ground him at a personal level and at a level where he's not experienced as Spider-Man. Of course in his first appearance Spidey just wants to be a part of a larger team, mainly the Fantastic Four. In this the Fantastic Four is substituted with the Avengers. They very much go back to basics and take Spider-Man to what makes the character work, being a kid that's out of his element. Once again he fights only one villain who this time is of course the Vulture and of course we even see him develop some of these relationships that might even have ties to the villain himself. And the film definitely delivers what is the definitive version of Spider-Man and also Peter Parker. He's witty, he's funny, and he knows when to take it seriously when he has to. But he's still very young and naive and having a fun time just like Spider-Man was in the early comics. Overall, Spider-Man Homecoming is probably the best interpretation of the character in live action so far. And I definitely think that as well. You guys let me know what you think is the best representation of the character so far in live action.